All right, greetings everybody. And today we're going to be taking a look at these two integrals out here. These are actually called the Fresnel integrals. And we're going to be using complex analysis to solve them today. So these two integrals, they're pretty much the integral from zero to infinity of the sine of x squared, as well as the cosine of x squared. And since we're using complex analysis, we're going to be kind of be killing two birds with one stone today. You see we have the sine and this cosine. It would actually be nice if we can use the complex exponential function because, well, we can just take the real and imaginary parts of one specific integral and you end up with these two integrals actually. So I'm actually going to define these two integrals as something. Let's call this first integral I sine. And let's call the second integral I cosine. Okay, just some weird notation there just to label those two integrals. And well, I want to combine those two together using Euler's formula actually. So if you consider the integral from zero to infinity of e to the i x squared dx, notice that if you use Euler's formula on this, you're actually going to get the cosine of x squared plus i times the sine of x squared like so. And well, if you use the linear property of the integrals to split it up and all that, you're going to find that if you take the real part of this integral, you're going to get well, this cosine of x squared, which is this, this i cos right here. And if you take the imaginary part of this integral, you're going to get this imaginary part, which is the sine of x squared, which will land you at, well, the first integral right here. So that's the basic idea. So if we call this integral right here i, so this integral, we'll just label it as i. I'll just put it over here. If we take the real part of i, so real part of this thing right here, we're going to end up with i cos. This is going to be i cos. And if we take the imaginary part of our i, we're going to end up with i sine, like so. That's the basic idea. And now the problem, or well now what we want to do now is to solve this integral. And um, how can we solve this? Well, I'm not going to be use, taking the usual approach with complex analysis um, because usually there's a specific contour you're going to use. I'm going to take a bit of a different approach, actually. Um, it's still going to require contour integration, but not in the um, usual way you would see it. So you see here we have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x squared. That looks a lot like our Gaussian integral, actually, because our Gaussian integral is like just the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x squared. Um, or could it be from negative infinity to infinity, but it really doesn't quite matter. So. As you can see here, we have an i, and we would like to get rid of the i and replace it with a negative 1, so that we actually get our Gaussian integral right here, and we actually know that evaluates to square root of pi over 2, because we're on like the half interval right here. So how can we do that? Well, let's just, first of all, force a negative into that. So this is equal to integral from 0 to infinity, we have e to the minus, and then let's just kind of isolate this exponent right here, we're going to get minus i x squared like so, dx. You see those two minuses will actually cancel each other out, leaving us with e to the i x squared. Okay, and what can we do from here? Ideally, we want e to the minus something squared. So we don't really care what the something inside here is, as long as we have something squared. Then we can use a substitution to get, well, e to the minus something squared. So, Let's actually convert this minus i to polar form. We know minus i in polar form is exactly e to the minus i pi over 2. So this integral is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus. We have e to the minus i pi over 2. That's our negative i right there. And we have our x squared on the ends like so, dx. Okay. So we have this right now. And um, I guess just a quick note, the reason why I converted this thing to polar form is because powers are actually a little bit nicer to work with in polar form. So now we want this thing, well not this thing, but we want something squared. So why not factor out a power of 2? So we have a squared right here. Notice that we can bring out, or well, factor out a factor of 2 right here on this e to the minus i pi over 2. So this is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus. Now if we factor out the 2 right here, we're factoring out a half, we're going to get e to the minus i pi over 4, and then we have 
times x, and we can factor out the power of 2. So you can kind of verify this for yourself if you swear, if this root is squared right here, you're going to get an x squared first of all, which matches up right here, and you're going to get, well, distributing this right here, pi on 4 times 2, that's pi on 2, which is exactly this thing right here. So that's all good. So everything is equivalent up to here. And of course we have the dx. So now you see we have it in the form that we want. We have the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus something squared. And now we're ready to do our substitution. So we're going to let a new variable be this whole inside right here. So uh, let, where should we put it? Let's just put it over here. We're going to let, uh, let's see, we're going to let Let's use a new variable t, for example, be equal to this whole inside right here. So we're going to have e to the minus i pi over 4 times x. And then we can differentiate both sides. So now our dt is equal to e to the minus i pi over 4 times dx, like so. And well, we can isolate our dx because later we want to substitute this thing back in, actually. So that means our dx is equal to, well, just flipping, not flipping, negating the exponent right here, so bring it onto the other side, we're going to have e to the i pi over 4 times dt. Okay, all good. And um, I actually want to rewrite this um, integral, specifically these limits right here. Um, instead of having infinity, we're going to have some constant r, some really big number r right here. And um, we want this r to be infinity, so we're, going to just, so we're just going to take the limit. So limits as r approaches infinity. So everything should still be the same. Once r gets to infinity, then we basically get, well, our integral that we wanted back. So we have this now. Let's do our substitution. So let's plug everything in. So this is equal to, first of all, notice that our dx turns into this e to the i pi and 4 times dt. This constant right here, e to the i pi and 4, that's independent of our well, new variable t at least, so we can chuck that outside. And it's also independent of r, so we can actually chuck it outside the limit as well. So we're going to get e to the i pi over 4 times the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral. Now, what are our lower and upper bounds? Well, if you plug 0 into this x right here, our t will be 0. That's quite straightforward. But notice if you plug r into x right here, well, you're going to get some kind of complex number. So it's just going to be r times e to the minus i pi over 4. Okay, and how about our actual integrals? Well, this is going to be e to the minus. Remember, this we defined as our t. So this is just what e to the minus t, let's swear. Let's actually move this dx right here. It's a bit too low. And then, well, our dx turns into this factor times dt. That factor we already had out the front, so this just turns into a dt, like so. So, you see, we have this e to the minus t squared that we actually wanted. That's basically our Gaussian integral, but notice the limits are a little bit odd, actually. So, how can we integrate along some, well, to some complex number? Well, contour integration is the answer. So, let's um, jump into... Um, some contour integration now. Let's actually try to sketch out this path right here. So over here on the side notes, let's say this is our complex plane. We have our real axis and we have the imaginary axis. And well, ideally, what do we want? We want this to just be r only. So when we take the limit, as r approaches infinity, we have the integral from zero to infinity. So ideally we want a path that starts from zero and it goes along the real axis all the way up to some point r oh, like so. This is what we want. So a path going this way. But what do we actually have? We have a path going from zero to well, some weird complex number. And this complex number has a radius of r and an angle of well, minus pi and four. So minus pi and four is actually down here. And, well, it's the same distance away from the origin, so R, like so. So this path right here is actually a, an odd path that goes downwards in the complex plane to some point R times e to the minus i pi over 4. And, well, how can we relate these two paths right here? Because if we can relate those two paths, we can actually rewrite perhaps this integral in terms of the actual Gaussian integral, which would be very nice. 
So what I'm going to do, let's actually connect these two parts. We actually want to form some kind of closed contour, like so. And let's label this part going down right here, Psi. And let's label, I'll make this a bit bigger, actually. So R e to the minus i pi on 4. Let's label this curvy path right here, Gamma. And let's call this whole entire contour C. So what can we deduce from this picture right here? We know that the integral, or the contour integral, along our path C, we can actually decompose it into each of these separate parts right here. First of all, if we start at 0 and go down, we have the integral along our psi. And then we have the integral along gamma. So let's say gamma is going in the positive direction, so anti-clockwise. So this is plus the integral along our gamma. And then plus the integral. Now to close this loop, we actually need to go from r to 0. It's plus the integral from um, yeah, r to 0, like so. So this is the equation we're working with right here. So two things to note right here. This contour integral along this contour is actually zero. Reason being, well, the exponential function is an entire function, which means it has no poles in the whole of the complex plane. So using Cauchy's integral, what was it, Cauchy's um, integral theorem or something like that, I, I forgot what it's called. If the function you're performing this contour integral on is analytic in that domain, um, so the whole region there enclosed within and everything, then it's going to go to zero. So this contour integral, that actually vanishes off to zero. It's another fact is that this integral over gamma goes to zero as well, and that's what we're going to be proving. And if we can prove that integral along gamma goes to zero, what we can do, we can kind of bring this integral onto the other side, so the integral from r to zero, and in doing so, we're going to get a negative, but we can use that negative to kind of switch these bounds right here, Therefore, being able to show that the integral from 0 to r is nothing other than the integral over our psi, like so. So we can say this if and only if we can prove this um, integral along gamma goes to 0. And in that case, we can just well, get rid of this weird complex part right here. Alright, so what are we dealing with at the moment? We're dealing with the integral over our path in gamma. And our function is e to the minus, let's actually change the variable to z, so e to the minus of z squared, dz, like so. Okay. And what I want to do with this path, well, since it's a nice curvy path, it would actually be nice if we can parameterize it, make things a little bit simpler for us. So, if we, so on our path of gamma right here, every single point z can actually be described as, well, this circle right here actually has a radius of r, so we have r, and then e to the i of theta, where theta goes from down here all the way to zero. So actually, theta goes from minus pi and four, so minus pi and four all the way up to zero, like so. Okay, so we can differentiate both sides right here, so dz is equal to i times r e to the i theta, d theta, so it's just some basic chain rule stuff there. All right, so let's throw everything back into the integral. So now we have the integral. Bounds are negative pi and 4, so 0. And then we have e to the minus. z is exactly, well, we want z squared right here, so we actually have r squared e to the 2i theta. So just some um, exponential rules right there. If you square this e to the i theta, you actually get e to the 2i theta. And then our dz becomes i times r e to the i theta d theta, like so. Okay. So remember, this whole integral right here is still the integral of the gamma. We've just written it a bit differently. And so now what I want to do is we want to start estimating this integral a little bit. So putting some absolute values around it. So notice this is with respect to a real or a variable, so we can actually use the integral inequality. So how does that work? Well, if we have the integral over gamma, and we take the absolute value of this integral over gamma, we can actually say that this is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of the integrand. So we basically put this absolute values inside of this integrand right here. And well, this is going to turn into the integral from minus pi and 4 to 0, absolute value of e to the minus r squared, e to the 2i theta, i times r e to the i theta, 
Deep Vita, absolute value. Ashley, absolute value right there. Okay, so where can we go from here? We can kind of split the absolute values up right here because notice we have a bunch of things multiplied together. So this is equal to the integral from minus pi and four to zero. First of all, absolute value of i is one. So let's ignore that. Absolute value of r, well r is a really big um, positive number. So let's stick that outside the integral. And absolute value of this e to the i theta, well, distance of some complex number on a circle um, of radius one is just one from the origin. So that also disappears, leaving us with the absolute value of e to the minus r squared, um, e to the two i theta like so, d theta. All right, where can we go from here? Well, what I want to do now is split things up a little bit because notice we have this exponential, this complex exponential thing in the exponent right here. So let's use Euler's formula actually. So this is now equal to r times the integral from minus pi and four all the way up to zero of, let's see, absolute value still. And now we have e to the minus r squared, e to the 2i theta. Well, that's this cosine of 2 theta plus i times the sine of 2 theta. So if you can kind of expand things out in your head right here, this is going to give us minus r squared cosine of 2 theta. So that's the real part. We also got the imaginary part, which is minus i times r squared sine of 2 theta. And then d theta, like so. Okay. So from here, let's actually split up this exponential function right here because notice we have two additive things right here. So let's just stick another e in here um, just to save some space. And we can also split up the absolute values like so. Okay, and I want you to notice one thing right here. This part right here, this is e to the, well, technically i times some real number because r squared is a real number. Theta is a real parameter, so sine of 2 theta is also real, and negative 1 is also real. So essentially we have e to the i times some real number, and when you take the absolute value of that, that's going to give you 1, because, well, again, you're on the unit circle. So the absolute value of this actually vanishes up to 1, leaving us with this thing. But this thing, this is just e to the minus, well, some real number right here, and the exponential function is always positive, so we can actually get rid of the absolute values there, which is quite nice. So now this is equal to r times the integral from minus pi to four, all the way up to zero, of e to the minus r squared times the cosine of two theta. And then we have our d theta hanging off the ends like so. All right, very nice. We've gone quite a long ways actually. We've simplified, well, this whole junk right here, this parameterized thing into something that we can actually do some work on. Uh, we can actually estimate thing, this thing a little bit further. And if you've watched my um, Jordan's Lemma Proof video, um, we also encountered something that looks um, a little bit like this, where we actually had to use some approximations to bound our trig function up here. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's get rid of, um, yes, all of this stuff right here. And now we're gonna get into some graphing, which is quite, Quite nice. So let's consider the interval from minus pi and four to zero. So if we kind of sketch this out right here, let's um, make this a little bit better. So let's start over here. Here we're going from minus pi and four to zero. So let's say pi and four minus pi and four is here, which means that pi on two is probably somewhere over here um, and yeah. So we have cos. We want to graph this cosine right here because. We actually want to bound this cosine. So if this is our theta axis, and I don't know what to call this other axis right here, cosine of two theta, I guess. Let's see. We want to graph this thing right here. So cosine of two theta, this is positive pi on four, then we have pi on two, and then, well, probably a pi over here as well. A period of the cosine graph is actually 2 pi, but since we have this 2 in this argument right here, we're shrinking that down by a factor of 2, which means that a period is only, well, pi. So we want to complete a cycle of our cosine graph in a period of pi. So it's going to look something like this. Um, I can probably do a better job than that, but it's going to look something like this. It's 
going to go up again to pi. Okay, so that's what it looks like on the positive half. So a period of pi, half a period at pi and 2, and a quarter period at pi and 4. And let's actually mirror that onto the other side. And notice that we actually have a, um, an intercept at pi and 4. So if we mirror this onto the other side, like so, this is the kind of graph that we're going to get. And the interval we're actually interested in is from minus pi and 4 to 0. But we're only interested in this region right here. So from minus pi and 4 to 0. And looking at this integral right here, we want to somehow bound our cosine a little bit. And what makes it, how can we bound this thing? What makes the most sense in this case? Well, first we'll notice R squared is always positive, so nothing to really worry about there. We want to look at the negative exponential function. So let's do some more graphing over here. If you look at the negative exponential function, it's actually some kind of decay like so. And I want you to notice one particular feature of this graph right here. If I have some point right here, let's call it A, and another point B, where B is greater than A, so let's actually write it the other way. It's a bit easier that way, so A is less than B. Okay. What can we say about the output right here? So this is right here, this point is f of a. And this point right here, that's f of b. So if a is less than b, f of a is actually greater than b. So that's one important thing to realize. So f of a is actually greater than f of b, like so. And it's actually this right here. Remember, our f is actually our exponential function. We want to show that this integrand is less than or equal to something else. So if, for example, this thing right here, what we have so far, let's say that this thing right here is actually f of b right here, okay? In order to show that's less than or equal to, so to show that f of b is less than f of a, we actually need to find some a that is a less than b. So, and what is our a and b? What is our input to our exponential function? It's actually this, thing right here. So R squared cosine of 2 theta. But R squared, that's always positive. Um, and we actually don't need to worry about that because it's a constant. Main thing we need to worry about is this cosine right here. So cosine is our A and our B. It's our input right here. And remember, we want to find A so that we can bound F and B from above with F of A right here. So we want to find some kind of A that's smaller than B. This is our B right here. So this thing right here is our B. And we want to find some kinds of A. So A is something smaller than B right here. And if you look at our B on this graph right here, so we want to find some kind of function on here. On this interval, that's always less than the cosine graph. And the easiest one to think of is actually a straight line that passes through these intercepts right here. So notice that this line right here, let's call that line L. So L is this line. L is always less than or equal to cosine of 2 theta. So let's pretend our b is our cosine of 2 theta. So let's rub that out. Let's replace b with the cosine of 2 theta. So right here would be f of cosine of 2 theta. This line l right here, that's our a. So let's rub that out and replace it with l. So you see, right here, since l is actually less than the cosine of 2 theta on this interval right here, f of cosine of theta, which is this exponential function around here, will actually be bounded above by f of l. So, our goal now is to find l. What is l exactly? That's quite easy to find out because notice our intercept right here, that's 1. And we can use some rise over 1 to find the gradient. So, right here, this intercept is pi and 4. So, rise is 1, 1 is pi and 4. So, 1 over pi and 4, that's 4 and pi. So, l is actually equal to 4 over pi times theta, because theta is our variable right here. So we have our gradient, what's our intercept? That intercept is at 1, so 4 and pi theta plus 1. Like so that's the equation of L. Okay, and an important thing to note right here is that L is always less than um, or equal to cosine of 2 theta for all theta on this interval right here. So for all theta, on the interval minus pi and 4 all the way up to 0. Like, so that's the interval we're integrating across, remember. So now let's actually plug everything in since we have all this information now. So we've, sh so we've shown that if we replace this cosine right here with our L, 
we can actually bound this integral from above. So what does that look like right here? This integral, that's actually less than or equal to r times the integral from minus pi and 4 all the way up to 0 of e to the minus r squared. And now since we have this less than or equal to thing right here, this cosine is actually going to turn into our L. And our L is um, 4 on pi theta plus 1, like so, d theta. And this integral is actually quite um, easy to evaluate. It's just a standard exponential integral kind of thing with some random constants inside. So, if we can evaluate this thing right here, we're actually all good. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's rub out this graph, we don't need it anymore. So we want to evaluate this integral right here. So this right here, let's actually split up this exponential thing in here a little bit. So this is equal to r times the integral from minus pi and 4 all the way up to 0 of, if we split this up right here, this is going to give us e to the minus, um, let's say e to the minus r squared and then we have 4 over pi theta plus 4 so 4 over pi times theta and then let's distribute with this negative right here and since we're doing addition kind of we can split up the exponential so this is e to the minus what well, just minus r squared by itself actually and then d theta and we can notice this thing right here that's just a constant in terms of um, theta, so we can chuck that up the front. So this is equal to r times e to the minus r squared integral from minus pi and 4 to 0. Let's clean things up a little bit here. Oh, it's already cleaned up for us, but e to the minus um, r squared times 4 over pi times theta, like so. Okay, and we have our d theta right here. So this is equal to now r times e to the minus r squared and anti-differentiating this thing that's not too much of a big deal we just take the reciprocal of this inside right here which happens to be minus um, pi over 4 r squared like so and then well the exponential function stays as it is so e to the minus r squared 4 over pi theta from minus pi and 4 all the way up to zero like so all right, from here, it's just a matter of substituting in those bounds. So this is equal to r times e to the minus r squared. This thing right here, notice that's just a constant, so we can chuck that out the front as well. So this is minus pi over 4 r squared, like so. And what do we have on the inside? Well, plugging in the zero into this theta right here, it's going to turn this whole argument into a zero, leaving us with e to the zero, which is just actually one. Then the second part of integration, minus, if we plug minus pi and 4 into here, we're going to get, let's just put everything in, so e to the minus r squared, 4 over pi, and then minus pi over 4. These pi's are going to cancel each other out, these 4's are going to cancel each other out, these minuses are going to cancel each other out, and what, well, this thing is just basically e to the r squared left inside. So overall, now we have, we can do some simplifications out here as well, we're going to have minus pi, and then, let's see, r squared and r can cancel each other out, leaving us with e to the minus r squared over 4r. Hope I'm doing everything right. Should be right. Then we have 1 minus e to the r squared, essentially. And let's actually, yeah, we can bring this minus into here if you want to. Um, to switch it, or we can just expand this thing directly to get, well, we have a 1 right here, so this is going to give us minus pi e to the minus r squared over 4r, and then expanding it into this um, term right here, we're going to get plus pi e to the r squared, we'll actually cancel it with this e to the minus r squared, leaving us with a 1, and then over 4r. Like so, that should be correct. Okay. So this thing right here, what did, what, what exactly is that thing? We've shown through a um, series of inequalities that the integral of a gamma is actually less than or equal to this thing right here. If you if you kind of go back and trace back the inequalities, you'll find that the absolute value of the integral of a gamma is less than or equal to that thing right there. So I'll just write it as pi over four 
um, or for r minus and then pi times e to the minus r squared over four r like so. This is what we've basically shown in the past, I don't even know how long, 15, 20 minutes, I don't even know. And um, well, we wanted to take the limit as our r approaches infinity, remember? Because we had our contour, which looked like this, and then we wanted these r's right here, so r and r, to both go to infinity, so it's gonna be infinitely out like this. So we actually wanna take the limit as our r approaches infinity, that would be quite nice. If we take the limit as our r approaches infinity of the absolute value of, of gamma, that's going to be equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of, well, this thing right here. So that's gonna be um, pi over four r minus pi e to the minus r squared over 4r like so. Okay, and so where can we get from here? Well, it's quite easy to see where this will go actually because as r approaches infinity on this term, the denominator is going to grow really big. This is going to go to zero. Same thing over here. Um, we have a denominator of r. Furthermore, we have this e to the minus r squared negative exponential function, which is just going to pull this term down to zero as well. So this is going to go to zero in the limit. So we've shown in the limit, um, this should be an inequality actually, so less than or equal to, because kind of from here, remember? So limit as r approaches infinity of the absolute value of the integral of the gamma, that's less than or equal to zero. Hmm. But you see here, this is an absolute value. So this thing right here, that's a positive number. And we're saying this is less than or equal to zero in the limit. So the only way for this thing to kind of work out, I guess, is if it's zero itself in the limit. So this implies that the limit as r approaches infinity on the absolute value of the integral over gamma is equal to zero. And absolute value of this thing in the limit is equal to zero. Well, that means that this thing right here on the inside is actually zero itself because, well, that's the only way for this thing to be zero actually. So, well, this implies that in the limit, as our r approaches infinity on the integral of gamma, that's going to give us zero. So, why did we want to show all of this? Well, remember if we could show this fact right here, we could actually show that the integral over psi is the integral from zero to r. So since we've been able to show that this integral of gamma goes to zero, integral over psi is basically the same thing as integral from zero to r. And that's basically where we're going to um, finish off this video. So remember the integral over psi? That was basically the, the integral from zero to r times e to the minus i pi over four of e to the minus t squared dt. So this came from this right here. And well, i is exactly e to the i pi over four times the limit as our r approaches infinity of integral from zero to r times e to the minus i pi over four times of e to the minus t squared dt. And well, in this limit right here, if we apply this limit to this integral, this integral will actually turn into, well, just the integral from zero to r. So i in the limit is basically the same thing as e to the i point four times the limit as the r approaches infinity on the integral from zero to r over e to the minus t squared dt. And well, this is equal to e to the i pi m four times the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus t squared dt. And this is our half a Gaussian integral. So this is e to the i pi over four. And then that's going to evaluate to the square root of pi over two. So in conclusion, i is equal to e to the i pi over four times the square root of pi over two. And well, we wanted to find the Fresnel integrals. So I sine I cos. So what we do, take the real and imaginary part of this. Um, if you expand up this e to the i pi over four thing right here, you're actually going to find that it's equal to, let's see, root two over two times 
square root of pi over 2 plus i times root 2 over 2 times the square root of pi over 2, like so. So, in order to find i cos, i cos was in school from 0 to infinity of um, cosine of x squared dx. You just take the real part of this thing right here. So the real part, let's see, that evaluates to... And notice one cool thing, the real and imaginary parts are the same thing, uh, which is quite nice. So this is equal to... This is a 4 down here. So this is essentially the square root. Swearing 4 gives you 16. Dividing by this 2 in the square root right here gives you 8. So square root of pi over 8. You can check the algebra for yourself if you want to. But yeah, this is square root of pi over 8 plus i times square root of pi over 8, like so. So you see, the real part right here, square root of pi over 8. Very simple. And then, secondly, you also got the integral from 0 to... That was an ugly integral. Maybe I should stand at this side to draw my integrals. So, integral from 0 to infinity of the sine of x squared dx is the same thing, which is quite surprising and quite nice as well. So those are our two final results for this video. And I guess one thing, um, since x squared is a, um, an even function, you could also have the integral from minus infinity to infinity, in which case you would just have double these results right here. So if you consider the integral from ne negative infinity to infinity, you're just doubling that, so you're going to get 2 times the square root of pi over 8. And well, 2 squared is 4, so if we bring that in, going to get the square root of pi over 2, so you can check the algebra for yourself if you want to. But if you integrate these two functions from negative infinity to infinity, so over the real axis, you're going to get square root of pi over 2. And well, yeah, that's basically it. Um, the Fresnel Institute, we've evaluated them using complex analysis. So uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, love doing complex analysis as always. Um, but yeah, up until next time, have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.